guys and welcome to my draw my life i'm finally getting around to doing it and it took me a little while so i ended up writing it all down so if at any point i sound like i'm reading it is very well because i am so with that being said i am going to jump right in that's how i intro everything with that being said i'm gonna jump right in i was born may 14th 1987 to my two hippie parents, Dirk and Susie. Five years later, my sister Michelle was born, and two years after that, my sister Shayna. We were a loud family, and my childhood was spent playing pretend with my sisters. I took on the role of the oldest child and often led our childhood games. I would choreograph dances for us to perform, film movies on my parents' camcorder with my sisters, and sometimes even wrangle up the neighborhood kids. We actually have a famous family movie called The Fairy Tree, where I made both of my sisters play the lead roles. It was a movie about finding a magical fairy tree, but don't worry, by the end, Shayna found it. While my time at our childhood condo was full of fun memories, it also had some not so fun memories. Around nine years old, I was molested by the gardeners of our complex. This wasn't the first time though, the same thing had happened with our babysitter's son when I was really little, around four years old. It's a weird thing to talk about because I know so much worse happens to people, but it really affected me and it's something that I still deal with today. I went to a private school in elementary school, but to be honest, I didn't really like it. I never really fit in and I found myself being made fun of a lot. I was a very eccentric kid to begin with, and I think going to a private school made my eccentricities stand out more. I once started a stationery business where I would take orders at school and then print out the paper with people's initials on them. I would deliver the orders at school and charge $2 per stationery pack. One time, I made paper shoes and I wore them to school. I would draw on paper with all the colors of the rainbow and then I covered them in tape around my foot, my foot, you know, so they were waterproof. And then another time I wrote a movie script and I mailed them to different kids at the school. I assigned them their parts and I told them to memorize them because at my birthday party we would and did shoot the movie. Needless to say, my interests were definitely more right-brained, and after years of being made fun of, getting locked in bathrooms, having food thrown at me, dealing with teachers that were very open about not liking me, and having two of my best friends ditch me for not being Christian enough, I left in sixth grade and became homeschooled. Now, I loved homeschooling. The approach my mom took was very different. She kind of followed the unschooling method, meaning that I pretty much focused on the basics that I would need to get me through life, but then I dove deep into the things that I loved. For seventh and eighth grade, we didn't really follow a curriculum. She basically just made me read every day on topics that I liked. So for the seventh and eighth grade, I basically studied history, my favorite subject, and then read books on business and relationships. We did a lot of hands-on learning. I was enrolled in dance classes, singing classes, local community theater, and we would also take school field trips to museums, the science center, etc. She also really focused on helping me learn how to make friends. Now, I know that sounds strange, but homeschooling launched me into a different phase of my life. Most people experience what I was going through, I think, after high school, where all of a sudden you're not around the same people every day and you actually have to reach out to people to get together. But I just experienced it six years earlier. It was hard at first to make and keep friends, but I quickly became grateful because it really forced me to learn how to make friends anywhere. Now, business was always an important part of our family, so when I was 14, my mom told me that it was time to start figuring out how to make money. So, after thinking over what I could do to make money, I decided that I could teach dance. My parents ended up redoing a room downstairs in their house and making it into a dance studio. And this is when my first experience in business began. I ended up teaching dance to other homeschoolers for the next five years, and because of that business, I was hired to choreograph for dance teams at studios, schools, and throughout the city. But the coolest thing that I took away from that experience was seeing what it actually looked like to come up with an idea and have it become a reality. When I would put on recitals, I would have to see the whole picture and execute it. I would choreograph the dances, designed the costumes, hired a seamstress, found a location, printed and priced the tickets and costumes, hired a stage manager, hired a lighting person, emceed the show, and printed the programs. I tell you all of this not to brag because a lot of people could execute those tasks. 
but because it was the first time that a big idea in my head became a reality. And it showed me that if I take baby steps forward, I can make big things happen. And those years honestly shaped my thinking in a big way. Now, during those years of dancing and teaching, I ended up injuring my hip at dance camp. I was going across the floor, and after doing a leap, I landed and felt a snap in my hip. It took about two years of doctor visits, and finally after the doctors telling me that I was imagining things, my mom demanded that I have an experimental surgery. Well, the doctors were wrong, and after opening up my hip, they found that I had a bone spur snagged on my muscle. The surgery was successful and ultimately took away a huge amount of pain, but I was in a walker for six months and crutches for another six. I still get achy on my hip, but overall, that surgery helped so much. They ended up attributing the hip injury to my legs being uneven. So now I wear a heel lift. Now, one night in high school, I went to church poker night, which I'm not sure how that existed, and I met a guy named Dan. Now, I had never felt the way I felt when I saw Dan for the first time, but I guess his feelings were not quite mutual at the time, because we met about three or four times, but every time that we met, he didn't seem to notice me, and he almost kind of blew me off. Now, that didn't make me happy, because for me, no one had ever just ignored me. I was the kind of person that even if you didn't like me, you couldn't ignore me, but Dan did. So I wrote him off and stopped paying attention to him. Towards the end of high school, my sister Michelle and I got really sick. We came down with a mystery illness, a lack of energy, lack of appetite, hair loss, stomach pains, and muscle pains were just a few of the symptoms, but doctors did not know what was wrong. My parents spent so much time and money taking care of us, and we even went outside of our HMO to doctors who had written books, and still, no one could figure out what was wrong. Finally, after a doctor telling my mother that we were going to have to take pain management classes and just deal with this mystery illness for the rest of our lives, they took a different approach. We ended up going to San Francisco and visiting a doctor who had pioneered the use of vitamin C. He was the first doctor to blatantly tell us that he did not know what we had and that he didn't really care. He said that he judged a sickness based on how much vitamin C someone could tolerate. He said that the sicker you were, the more you could handle. Vitamin C is water soluble, so if your body doesn't need it, you pee it out or something else. <laughs> we ended up having about 300 milligrams of vitamin C put into us in two days. Days. And to put that into perspective, one packet of emergency is one gram. When we left his facility, I will never forget that day because when I walked out, I knew I was better. We continued to take massive amounts of vitamin C over the next couple of months, but slowly weaned off as our tolerance lowered and our health improved. A couple months later, after visiting that doctor, I signed up for singing classes at our local community college. The final for that class was a singing show where we had to invite our friends. The day of the show, I pulled up to the school and when I got out of my car, I saw Dan, the boy who had blown me off multiple times about a year before. He proceeded to walk over to me and introduce himself as if we had not met the other four times. Apparently, I hadn't made an impression before because he had no recollection of ever meeting me. After that day though, Dan came kept tabs on me, and he ended up inviting himself to my 19th birthday. We had a ton of mutual friends, but still, and after that birthday, the boy pursued me. He called me every single day for the next month and had different date ideas planned. Beach trips, bonfires, and in and out filled my next month. We laughed a lot, and it was just really, really easy. We got along so well that after that month of hanging out, he asked me to be his girlfriend. And 11 months after dating, he asked me to marry him. Now, the crazy part was that the day after Dan proposed, my parents were actually leaving to China to pick up my brother, Casey. My mom had always wanted to adopt, and it was finally happening. Eight months later, Dan and I got married, and Casey ended up being the ring bearer. The day was beautiful and emotional and perfect for us. Now, when Dan and I had started dating, he had helped me get a job performing at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Yes, the theme park. Because of that job, I fell in love with working at theme parks and also began working at Universal Studios Hollywood. Performing at a theme park is like theater on crack. I would do 12 shows a day sometimes and played up to 19 different roles. It was an absolute blast and I highly recommend it as a job for people who love theater. After working at Universal Studios for two years, I was offered to move to Singapore to be a part 
part of the opening cast for the new park. Dan and I felt that the opportunity to be paid to move and perform in another country was an awesome opportunity and we couldn't pass it up. So in 2009, we moved to Asia. Now, I've had so many questions about my experience in Singapore. The country and the people were incredible. Beautiful, thriving, high-tech, and safe. Dan and I had two roommates while we lived there. They were incredibly sweet and super talented girls who became good friends of mine. And the hard part of the trip came when I re-injured my knee. I had knee surgery when I was 20 after injuring my knee working at Universal Hollywood, but I thought that I had fully healed. Apparently, I hadn't. I ended up being in so much pain that I was down for five months, and after living in Singapore for a total of eight months and seeing no end in sight for my knee pain, we decided to go home. They offered me a job as a face character so I could stay and make money, but I'd come to perform, Dan couldn't get a job, and I missed my family, so going home made the most sense. When Dan and I got home, we had to move in with my family. We thought we would be coming home with a ton of money, so we'd gotten rid of everything we owned, including our cars. Now in other places, this may not seem like a big deal, but in LA, it's pretty much a necessity. So we had to build our life back up from the ground up. Dan's old boss hired him back as a welder, so he pretty much returned to work a few days later. I, on the other hand, for the first time in my working life, had no idea what I was going to do. So I decided to try and act. I had pursued acting when I was younger after performing as Annie at 13. I didn't love the industry, but I loved to perform. So because I had no idea what else to do, now that I officially couldn't dance, I pursued acting. I took acting classes, marketing classes, branding classes, and worked with a career coach. But a few months later, in July of 2010, everything changed. Now I realize that this next part of the story may sound crazy to some people, but it's the truth. One morning in July of 2010, I woke up and I felt like God was telling me to get on YouTube. Just that, get on YouTube. Now, I have no idea what I was supposed to do on YouTube, like look up videos, or I wasn't quite sure. At this point, I just thought of YouTube as a place for cat videos and occasionally a place for a video answer I was looking for. So after searching YouTube, I stumbled upon all of these videos of girls talking about beauty products. And I thought, hey, that looks fun, I could do that. So I filmed a video. My first video was a nail polish favorites, but five minutes after uploading the video, I felt so embarrassed that I took it down. I was always a girly girl, but not a beauty guru. And honestly, I was used to performing, not talking about beauty products. I moved on with life and I didn't upload another video. But after four months of the thought not going away, I proceeded to upload the same video again in November. But once again, five minutes later, I took it down. One month later in December, while driving to a casting director workshop, I leaned over to turn on my radio. And when I turned it on, it was the Dave Ramsey show. Dave, the host, immediately said, hi, what's your name? And the response would change my life. Shay Carl, said the voice in the line. He proceeded to tell Dave about his full-time YouTube job and how he paid off his debt by making videos online. I immediately felt chills down my spine and I knew what I needed and wanted to do when I got home. That day, I uploaded my official first YouTube video and I hit the ground running. I don't know why, but a switch flipped and I immediately pursued YouTube full force. Dan continued to work his job 60 plus hours per week as a welder and studying to be a welding inspector, while I made YouTube videos, tried to grow my audience, and made friends with other YouTubers. My family could not have been more supportive. They encouraged us to live with them as long as needed until my income from YouTube equaled a full-time income. It took me about six months to make $100, but a year after that, in the summer of 2011, I was making enough money from YouTube for our incomes to support a move out. Now, honestly, from here, I'm not sure where to go. You guys have seen my life for the last couple years and I've really tried to be open and honest about who I am with you guys. You have changed my life in more ways than you will ever know. And I appreciate you all more than I can say. While I have no clue where my future will take me, my biggest goal in all of this and life in general is to inspire people to go after their dreams. I have no idea where I'm gonna be in five years, but hopefully I will be following my dreams. Albert Einstein has a quote that I love and I think it sums it up perfectly. And my goal in life is to show everyone that this quote is true. It says, everyone is a genius at something. 
but if you try to make a fish climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking that it is stupid. You are special and you were made for a purpose. You are genius at something. And if I could sum my life goal up into a statement, it would be that. I wanna help others understand the greatness that they are capable of. Just keep dreaming, keep learning, and keep moving. I love you guys and thank you for everything. Bye guys. There's so much that I have told you, but it's all in my head. Ask me anything.